What is life? It's being alive, the condition that distinguishes animals and plants from inorganic matter. And our planet teems with life. Low life. High life. Life forms invisible to the naked eye. Life forms that tower over our own. Yet for all the ready specimens, there is no simple definition of life. Some things are clear. The plant is alive. The robot, though much more active, is not. And this tortoise is very much alive. This rock is not alive, but the limpets disguised as rocks are. For many people, life is a philosophical and religious matter. In many religions and mythologies, life, especially human life, is a kind of spark, a divine gift. Many beliefs trace the origin of the universe and the source of all life to a cosmic egg. The ancient Egyptians depicted their god, Tar, as a potter who crafted the egg of the world. And in Babylonian myth, humankind was made from clay, mixed with the flesh and blood of their gods. Christians and Jews alike have God creating the first human life, Adam, from earth and dust. Eve was made from one of Adam's ribs. The Native American Zuni tribe believed human life was sparked when underworld creatures crawled up to earth and came nearer to the gods of the sky. For centuries, we have fantasized about magical ways of creating life. Nowadays, it's believed that life may have required some kind of spark, but instead of magic, the process began through chemistry. When massive volcanic eruptions scorched the Earth millions of years ago, heat and pressure reached colossal extremes. There was little atmosphere, and the planet was bombarded by the sun's fierce ultraviolet rays. The land became a bubbling cauldron, lashed by thunderstorms, and from this chemical soup, many new compounds emerged. Among them, amino acids, the building blocks of life. Scientists now believe this was enough to launch life. The conditions made it chemically inevitable. In the 1950s, two Chicago scientists, Miller and Urey, reconstructed the planet's primitive conditions on a smaller scale. With laboratory lightning, replacing thunderstorms, the experiment yielded the same amino acids that originally created life forms. Not at all the kind of macabre human engineering featured in horror movies. The first creature feature took time. It was millions of years before the chemicals combined to create something with the talent crucial to any life form the ability to copy itself. Without this knack, an organism would become extinct in a single generation. Copying is a key rule for life. Many primitive organisms reproduce by combining and dividing. Visible only under a microscope, they're cytoplasm, blobs of jelly, only able to eat and get around. They outnumber every other living thing on Earth, and the human body plays host to millions of them every day. Primitive life can multiply at breakneck speeds. Colonies of minuscule mold can cover a piece of bread in just a few hours. In the competition for food, bigger tends to be better. An organism with just one cell may need to pool its simple talents with others, like a sponge. It's a colony in which each cell has its own position. If a sponge is shredded, it will reassemble itself with each member returning to its original spot. Just one thing, try it with a living sponge. Otherwise, you'll just block up the drain. Having an array of cells that specialize allows for an even higher quality of life than a sponge. Leaf cells, 
branch cells, flower cells, fruit cells, skin cells, nose cells, shell cells, enabling all kinds of lifestyles. A comb jelly shows off plenty of specialization. Its outer cells are pulsating filaments, so a comb jelly can move through the water and resemble a floating casino, too. Multicelled life comes in a mind-boggling array, the heavy, the tall, the fast, the strong, the smart, the colorful, the just plain weird. How did such rampant specialization happen? How did the leopard get its spots, the pine tree its cones, the bird of paradise its plumage, or the sailfish its fabulous fins? According to the Bible, God created all animals, and the ones that exist today were saved by Noah in his ark. In Rudyard Kipling's stories, animals got their features through their adventures. The elephant got his trunk stretched in a struggle with a crocodile. But early scientists argued that animals changed according to their needs. The naturalist Jean de Lamarck suggested that early giraffes may well have had short necks, but each individual stretched its neck a bit further in the search for leaves, and then could somehow pass on these acquired characteristics. We now know the process is different. As Charles Darwin, the English naturalist, theorized, he called the process natural selection. <laughs> he imagined that as a life form copies itself, it produces sometimes an imperfect copy, a mutation. Most mutations are inferior individuals and don't survive, but every now and then, a useful mutation occurs, something that gives an individual an advantage over its parents, like being less visible to predators. Copying itself, it's the first of a slightly new breed. It was on the Galapagos Islands that Darwin noted that various species of giant tortoises had evolved to match their environment. On an island with bushy vegetation, the tortoises had a notch in their shells, allowing them to reach up to higher food. The special neck feature was not found on islands with low greenery. Darwin argued the notched neck started with a mutation or two, tortoises with a chance defect that happened to help it reach food. Because they ate better, they lived longer, and passed on the trait. Put simply, it was the survival of the fittest. Evolution can take different routes to the same place. For example, a fish and a land mammal both evolved into very similar shapes, the tuna and the dolphin. And a coal from Australia. and an ocelot from far off South America share a remarkable resemblance in lifestyle, although they evolved independently. Evolution results in some great solutions, but it's chancy and slow. For each useful mutation, there are thousands of pointless ones. But life has a way of improving the odds and accelerating the evolutionary process. It's called sex and it's caught on with some of the smallest creatures. Hydroid polyps on the seabed reproduce in two stages. First, they bud and release different tiny organisms. Then each of these release sex cells, which unite with another individual. Two simple organisms create a completely new one. It's sexual reproduction, plain and simple. By combining in order to reproduce, there's a better chance of new, improved features in the offspring, and that gives a species a better chance of adapting to changing conditions. But 
But sex does rely on the meeting of sex cells. Plants rooted in the earth must rely on go-betweens and couriers to carry sex cells to receptive neighbors. A plant lures help with dazzling flowers and rewards visitors with nectar. Hopefully the ploy will pay off when the messengers unwittingly ferry the plant's pollen to others of its kind. Some creatures perform bizarre dances to attract mates. Before these male birds of paradise get to create any new life, they have to show some life. The kingfisher woos his lady by proving he could provide plenty of fish for her and their family to be. Some must fight man to man for the chance to mate. Elephant seals don't exactly fight by the Marquis of Queensberry rules. But then the urge to create new life finds colorful expression among humans as well. There's no shortage of plumage. There's plenty of adornment and use of lures. There are endless rituals to endure and gyrations to perform along the way. Although sexual reproduction requires vast amounts of energy, nature has not found a better way of passing on characteristics and enabling change. And change it can. Long ago, Chinese farmers learned that by planting high-yield rice, along with rice which ripened quickly, they got high-yielding, fast-growing rice. And pig farmers all over the world had discovered that crossing one fat pig with another fat pig resulted in a very fat pig. This Lester sow weighed about the same as a small truck. But attempts at breeding weren't always reliable. No one understood why until an Austrian monk named Gregor Mendel hit upon the basics of hereditary genetics in the 19th century. He crossed red and white sweet peas and found the first offspring were all red. But when plants of the new generation were crossed, white flowering plants appeared. It seemed that all characteristics are passed on and can surface in later generations. That knowledge has now led to heartier wheat, crunchier apples, bigger sticks of celery, tomatoes in size small or large. And there were even juicier oranges to be engineered. An essential for all life is growth. The seed grows into a plant. Somehow a baby in the womb knows to start growing. For life to reproduce, it needs to grow. Otherwise, birth would be impossible. Rather than which came first, the chicken or the egg, it would be how did the egg ever come out of the chicken? Life needs to arrive in small packages and grow in order to reproduce. It's not easy when the creature has a hard shell. Snails just add to their shell size as they grow. They are the world's official slowpokes at 0.03 miles per hour. Others, like the lobster, must move out and grow larger premises from time to time. On the way to adulthood, some animals undergo complete change into totally different forms, each suited to a particular stage of life. A caterpillar is an eating machine designed to grow quickly. Transformed into a butterfly, it becomes a breeding machine. Jellyfish drift for months, looking more like plants than animals, until they find a suitable place to develop into adulthood. Growth has its limits, although not in the movies. Some real dinosaurs were huge, but their size made it difficult to adapt to changing conditions and could have caused their downfall. 400 years ago, the Italian, Galileo Galilei, worked out that 300 feet was as tall as any living thing could be. The California sequoia tree matches this 
almost to the foot. But where do the instructions for growth come from? All living things contain their own blueprints in an astonishing chemical called DNA, raveled up inside every cell. One double helix of DNA stores the instructions to build a complete organism, whether it's an ant, an oak tree, an elephant, or a daisy. The data needed to build even a simple organism would fill 200 encyclopedias, yet it's all held inside a tiny molecule of DNA. Working like a recipe book, it is the exact arrangement of the crosslinks, like rungs of a ladder, that is the key to the characteristics of different species and individuals. During sexual reproduction, the double helix from each parent divides. So the offspring get half of their DNA information from one parent and half from the other. The new generation may get the male parent's coloring and the female's aroma, or mother's wings and father's spots, mother's smile and father's temper, mother's legs and father's face. To grow and function, an organism must eat. Many consume their own body weight every month. Some animals are carnivores, others strictly vegetarian, it's only plants that can create their own food. It was long thought that plants got all their food from the soil. Then Jean-Baptiste Van Helmont, a Belgian doctor, planted a willow shoot, first weighing it and the soil. Years later, the tree had gained a lot of weight, yet the soil weighed the same. Where had all the material for growth come from? Plants take only water and minerals from the earth. Most of their food is created from carbon dioxide and sunlight in the process called photosynthesis. These elements are turned into glucose, which a plant uses as energy. Many life forms take their food ready wrapped from plants. Others devour the plant eaters and may get devoured in turn. Worms and bacteria clean up what's left. Humans need to eat as much as they weigh every 50 days. Thousands of truckloads of food in a lifetime to keep the blood circulating and the heart beating 40 million times a year. The need to eat creates some strange relationships. The Portuguese man of war can fall prey to tiny raft snails, which slowly devour the larger animal, stinging tentacles and all. Even that seems tasty compared with what one French taxi driver was willing to eat. On a bet, he consumed an entire single-engined airplane, bit by ground to bit, mixing it with his normal meals, giving new meaning to bad airplane food. Even young creatures have to convert their food into energy. For that, they need oxygen, happily the waste product of photosynthesis. This is the source of all the oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. The larger rainforests produce more than enough oxygen to supply the needs of our densely populated cities. Oxygen is vital even in the ocean. The structure blossoming on the back of this mollusk is a primitive gill to extract oxygen from the water. It's a system used by most fish. Water is passed over the gills, oxygen extracted, and the water pumped out, usually through a fine filter to eliminate debris. The primitive hagfish has no filter, and must constantly eject waste. Mammals and reptiles get their oxygen by expanding their body cavities, creating a vacuum, which air rushes in to fill. In its lifetime, a cheetah breathes enough air to fill the Houston Astrodome.
Frogs and toads make extra use of the air they breathe. In courtship, their mouths and throats can be enlarged to a seemingly magical degree. No wonder they're linked to witchcraft. Encased in its shell, a tortoise can't expand its body cavities. Since breathing is hard work, it has learned to manage with very little oxygen. Birds are incredible breathing machines. Their remarkable lungs and air sacs allow them to breathe in and out simultaneously. Permanently inflated lungs, skylarks can sing without pausing for a breath. Geese can fly long haul at very high altitudes with enough breath to spare for the occasional honk. But oxygen isn't always a requirement for life. Deep in the Pacific Ocean, strange bacteria survive without sunlight on gases from volcanic vents. In a bizarre food chain in the permanent twilight of the ocean floor, translucent tube worms six feet long absorb the ghostly bacteria through their skins. For many life forms, feeding, growing, and breathing are not enough. To survive, they must be alert to danger and be ready to react to opportunity. Most plants cannot react when threatened, but they can indeed move. Flowers move to track the sun. Roots are moisture detectors. A pitcher plant gradually opens a deadly trap. Some plants react with a vengeance and catch much needed food. And animals have developed an alarming array of reactive equipment. The pit viper can react to prey hidden in the dark, thanks to its infrared vision. A warm-blooded creature can run, but it can't hide from the viper for long. Bats use sonar, with squeaks so hyped they can't even be heard by human ears. But the moths who are their prey have their own reactive capability, extra sensitive hearing. A shark can swim six times faster than a human. It reacts to the low frequency sounds put out by creatures in distress. In the face of danger, some animals can make only a passive defense. Others can leap into action. For really speedy reactions, there's no beating the legendary cheetah. It does zero to 45 miles per hour in two seconds, peaking near 60. That's like a 100 meter dash in 3.6 seconds. A hummingbird can also touch 60 miles per hour, yet hover with enough precision to thread a needle. It can even fly backwards. Hawks and falcons are the fastest living things in the air. Peregrine falcons have been clocked at over 200 miles per hour. The hawk is a creature steeped in myth. In ancient Egyptian legend, the goddess Isis became one and tried to fan life into her dead husband. Temperature is key to a body's chemical processes. Humans have little tolerance. Just five degrees either side of normal is not good news. To combat extremes of temperature, humans, like most mammals, have various control systems. When it's hot, they sweat. And when it's freezing, they shiver and release stored energy. Blood vessels swell when it's hot and shrink when it's cold. Which is why cold noses turn blue. The tortoise, like all reptiles, relies on external heat, normally provided by the sun. In cold weather, they welcome a warm place to hibernate. Some life forms seem indestructible. In Antarctica, bacteria and some spiders can thrive in temperatures of 40 degrees below zero. How some beetles and cockroaches survive sub-zero temperatures was a mystery 
since like all creatures, they're made up mainly of water. But they were found to contain diethyl sulfoxide, a form of antifreeze. Nature once again had invented a solution before we did. The amazing adaptability of life on Earth makes it possible to consider life beyond it. If organisms can survive extremes on Earth, could something endure the bone-crushing pressures of Venus? Or the scorching wastes of Mars? These microfossils from a meteorite believed to have come from Mars raise new questions. Was there once life on Mars? Can we assume all life originated here on Earth? Or could it have started elsewhere and fallen to Earth, locked up in a meteorite? In a sky brimming with stars and their planets, who's to say we're alone in the universe? The more we learn of life, the more the boundaries blur. Take cells from inside a creation that consumes energy, respires, controls its temperature, and responds to stimuli. It can seem remarkably alive, yet it's not life at all. There is no living thing that does not eventually die. Life wears out. Yet such is the tenacity of life that if catastrophe struck the Earth, destroying every single thing, if just one molecule of DNA survived such a holocaust, could it be enough to start the whole thing over again? 